when it comes to hunting boots, how many pairs does one man need? Well, how many seasons are there? Turkey season? Deer season? Duck season? Dove season? Honey, how many pairs of boots does one man need? At least one more pair. For just about everything for hunting, go to MidwayUSA.com. I'm Larry Potterfield with Midway USA. Thanks for your business. At Midway USA, we put customers first. The Nitro Express shipping system is icing on the cake. It was a big investment of time and money to take super fast, low cost shipping to a whole new level. The Nitro Express helps ensure same day shipping and low shipping costs. We hope you enjoy the Nitro Express. We built it just for you. For just about everything for the outdoors, go to MidwayUSA.com. I'm Larry Potterfield with Midway USA. Thanks for your business. Hey everyone, thanks for listening to the Western Honey Hub Podcast. And in this episode, it is all about how to sell your deer and elk sheds and get the most out of your antler. It is shed hunting season for the most part. Southwest Wyoming's got to hang tight a little bit yet. Been one heck of a winter for the West, and shed hunting's been a contentious thing. Uh, from what I hear, it's even getting crazier than it has in the past. With numbers of people out, uh, it's it's kind of nuts. And I think this is something we could all discuss whether shed seasons are a good idea, whether um, more ethics need to be in place, which are not something you can regulate, um, but you can certainly advocate for. Uh, so what's the right deal here? What's the right thing to do? Uh, do we leave places alone? Do we leave our dogs? Do we um, just, I don't even have a clue. Uh, I know that um, I'm a, I am adding to the problem maybe, uh, because I am an antler buyer and that's what this episode is about. So I am contributing to the problem where I'm paying you to bring your hard work, uh, to me. So that can be, uh, something that, that maybe I'm the problem. I don't know. Uh, but I, yeah, there's a lot of different things that, that you can make money on as far as natural resources and, and what we pull out of the woods. So that's, there's other way, places that that's regulated and found to uh, work just fine. Um, so I'm going to stick with what I'm doing. Maybe that's we just need to be recreational shed hunters again. That's kind of what I'm leaning towards. Maybe we self-police ourselves just like... We kind of determine how much hunting time we should do based on uh, the happiness of our family and time with our family. So maybe we we just spend less time in the woods shed hunting. Um, maybe not making a business out of it. Maybe not doing it just for the money. Go out and have some fun by finding sheds. Uh, take your kids or, or nephew or whoever or you as a kid. Go find some antlers and have a good time with it. But do it on a weekend here and there, a uh, weekday. Um, just do it for fun. Maybe don't don't spend so much time having to get video. I noticed this year, having to get video of something dropping its antlers, probably causing some extra stress on on wildlife. I know they're not moving out of the way. Doesn't mean they don't see you. Uh, they're just too tired to to want to do anything about it. So before we get to the rest of this episode, number one, stay on the trails with your your side by side four wheelers, all that. It's a big problem here in South Dakota. It's driving me nuts. Uh, I got a coupon code in the show notes for Ridge Patrol. Check that out. It's down below. Uh, Wilderness Athlete. Also, coupon code down below. Check that out and use it. Uh, I've been consuming Wilderness Athlete on a daily basis. Uh, not just the the powder drinks, but the various supplements has been helpful. And then also, I am. you may be listening to this on the Outdoor Call radio app. Or you may be listening to this on my podcast. And uh, both are great places to consume it. You are getting everything on the Western Hunting Hub podcast. Uh, if you're getting it on the Outdoor Call radio app, you're getting episodes here and there. Um, so, But if you don't know what the Outdoor Call radio app is, go download that and listen to content all day long. Uh, that's something new that I'm going to be a part of. I'm not going anywhere with Waypoint. That's not changing that. Just another place to put content and partner up with some great people over there. So moving on to uh, um, 
Antler Bion. I've been sitting on this episode for over a year. So I've been sitting on this exact episode for over a year, debating how I wanted to do it, if I wanted to even do it at all, if I wanted to bring on a guest who was also an antler buyer and have him go along with me and talk back and forth about his his experience doing this and whatever else. Kind of, I, I actually recorded this. Uh, a week ago and I had a cold. I started editing it, looking, listening to it and I started like death. So, and I know I had a bunch of interruptions. I just want to record this one time through. So hopefully this is a good take. And I usually have, don't like to redo any episodes, but this is one I've got so much effort and passion and, and other antler buyers might disagree, but I got a lot of knowledge on this stuff that I want to share and help you as, as shed hunters and hunters get an idea of what you have and what it's worth. So, um, this kind of all starts with the fact that I always look for a way to make a buck. Uh, I always found ways in college to see if I could, um, a salesman doing some various things which I'm horrible at, uh, doing uh i trapped pigeons in college for a little while that was a riot that was so much fun catching pigeons in the dark i got stories on that that are that were really fun and selling those to dog trainers for five six bucks a pound a pound no uh five six uh dollars a bird um and ended up making a thousand bucks one summer and that was that was a lot for me as a college kid and had a great time doing it with no expenses So uh, I've always looked for a way to make a buck and I needed a way to uh, make some money in my transition from living in Colorado, making still a teacher salary, uh, but moving to South Dakota and being paid paid less uh, because cost of living here was uh, typically less. It's about the same, honestly, Uh, but it's the, the pay is less. So I had to make up for some some loss funding. So I, this came around and I'm going to share uh, a little story about, about what all happened with that. But COVID hit and I needed some, some changes really hit our lives. Mine included very like huge changes. We had an opportunity to move back to South Dakota and uh, another antler buyer uh, was a friend. Uh, he said, you should start buying antler for me. And Sure. All right. Maybe now's the time. It's, yeah, I just started this podcast, but you know what? I got some extra time to, to put some effort into this. So I said, sure. Uh, I just, this was March, April, 2020, maybe a little before that. And the, he, he said, he said, I'll teach you how to do this. So I was like, okay, let's FaceTime and look at how to score these things or not score to a uh, grade antler. What is this? What is that? How much should I buy it for? And he gave me some good, solid information. Um, but that's about it. it. It was, I asked a few questions here and there and I got some answers, but, um, the questions started getting vague answers pretty quick where it, it, what should I buy this for? I was like, well, whatever you can get it for is basically what the answer was. So it was really difficult to try and continue to learn, um, but I got, I got the information I needed and my plan was, sure, I'm going to buy a little bit, sell to him. We're going to call it good. Uh, that's what that was going to be. Ended up having a truckload of antler that I couldn't bring back to South Dakota in the move. Cause that was a whole load in itself. So I said, Hey, I got to find someone else to sell us to. Are you all right with that? Cause we kind of said I was going to come sell to you and that, uh, um, of course, of course it just was common sense. What am I going to do? you going to come out here and get it? No. So I needed to, to sell it there. Well, I found what happened to be his buyer. And I think that's what started it all because shortly after that, I continued to buy and I wasn't, I was just stockpiling. I didn't sell to anyone else again after that. But as, as I was buying, I started getting these calls almost threatening me, uh, saying, don't you dare go to someone else. You're selling to me, you're selling to me, you're selling to me. And it was like, it felt like I was being pimped out and being controlled. Uh, oftentimes when you have someone buy antler for you, 
uh, little country buyers, they will have a bigger buyer that are giving them cash to go buy. No one did that for me. I had my own cash. I started off with my own thousand bucks is what I think, or maybe 500 bucks. So I started with, started with that five or thousand bucks, bought and bought and took a little loan against myself and uh, sold. And that started just fueling it slowly built up that nest egg to keep keep building and building that, uh, that little business, which wasn't even a, an official business at the time, but had that, uh, just that, that really negative, uh, those phone calls and texts being kind of controlled and I hated it. Don't, and you probably can't tell, but I'm a redhead and you tell a redhead what to do. You have a hard time getting what you're wanting out of me. Cause I don't listen well sometimes in that regard, and that that drove me nuts. I'm stubborn, and I I also when I do something I'm going to do it. And this is one of those things where it ended up blowing up because I put effort into it. I advertised and I created things, and I started selling online and doing all this stuff. So it got pretty nasty, and I hadn't even sold to anyone else yet, and he thought I was. So. Uh, at that point I realized I'm done with this. I'm absolutely done. I don't want anyone controlling me, telling me that I'm going to be, I have to be under him. So whatever verbal contract we had, I broke it. And he's been waiting for those words to hear those, to just admit that I broke that verbally. Uh, but just like any other phone contract or whatever else, when you're getting treated poorly or you're done with it, you can get out of it. I was done with it. That was not a happy, great relationship that I wanted to be in. So I'm really happy that uh, right now that I'm out of that and I'm away from it. I'm not being uh, called and my buying is up to me. My selling is up to me and I don't have anyone I have to answer to. So that would be my one piece of advice in any business, any business owner or small business owner, someone starting something. Don't let anybody control you. It's your business. You make those decisions. And that's what I've been trying to do. So it didn't end well. Uh, we we don't really talk. We do not talk. Uh, and so I lost a friend over the deal, which was not what I was going for. We talked hunting all the time. And uh, hunting was, the conversations around hunting still got, that was a piece of it too. I hated talking hunting with him after a while. And there's not anyone I hate talking hunting with uh, because of the competitiveness that it turned into of, I shot a buck in Colorado, uh, uh, this is probably six years back now that no, 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 no. Three years back that I was, uh, totally belittled on. And, and I was, I was definitely bullied a little bit into thinking that this was just this little management buck, blah, blah, blah. You're just shooting these little dinky things. When you move to South Dakota, you can't be shooting those things here, blah, blah, blah. Just like, I was already kind of like, God, man, I, that was a great buck, but I know there was bigger, but that just sucked out a lot of fun. So I know this doesn't have a lot to do with, with shed hunting, but, uh, or shed buying, but that's kind of where this all started. And I moved back to South Dakota and it, this business has been blowing up ever since and just buying and buying and selling and buying, uh, and doing my best to create my own dog shoes. And that's where Black Hills Antlers came in to be. So on to you, you've, you've spent all this time all this gas money, uh, and even have sore knees to get out, find your sheds. Cause we have that old saying or new saying miles for piles, right? Uh, antlers have definitely this hold on us, this hold on us. That is, uh, it's, it's almost greater than money has, uh, that came up in a conversation the other day that people have things that antlers that they will not sell just like this stone sheep I'm, I'm talking about. You can get thousands of dollars for that thing, but I don't know if I want to sell it because it's, it's horns and antlers just are, everyone is different and they all may have a story to them or a characteristic that's not like the other. Uh, and you put a lot of effort in to get maybe $12 for that one antler or a hundred dollars for the one antler or, or even uh, $2,000 for the two antlers or one antler. There's, there is that kind of money in some of that stuff. So you, I totally understand it. Uh, I have a, a brown elk shed pile right here next to me. I have I don't sell any of my own brown stuff. I just recently started selling my own uh, hard white and chalk. That was just a recent decision. 
and I'm fine with it just mainly because I don't have the space for it and still have some of my, my cool ones sitting around. So as we make through this, this episode here, uh, the popularity of the shed hunting is just blown up. And with that, so is antler buyers. Antler buyers popped up. I'm the one of many during, during COVID. Uh, and I'll give that disclaimer that I have only been doing this for three years. So there's guys been doing this for three decades. Uh, and they're, they've got bigger business. Um, there's guys that have been doing it for longer, that, that longer two decades and my business is bigger. Uh, but I just want to give you the information you need to sell your antlers and know, uh, what it all entails On to the selling. So what are these antlers being used for? This is one of the big questions I get when I'm selling to people. Number one, quantity wise dog chews. Dog chews are for sure the biggest, biggest sale point for me, at least. Uh, I don't know about these China markets and what happens with any of those over there because a lot of poundage goes that way. Uh, but little things like that people don't know. Elk is a lot softer than uh, deer is. And mule deer is a lot softer than white-tailed deer is. And moose is even softer than any of them. Uh, caribou can be, is pretty soft or can be soft as well. Uh, and yeah, and it, there's different grades of that antler. A lot of chew companies just sell the, the high quality antler. I sell three grades of antler, just like I buy, sell three, buy three grades of antler. Mine are an economy, a mid grade and a premium grade dog chew. And you can check those out blackhillsantlers.com if you're curious what the heck they sell for. Uh, I feel like my prices are really good because I am a guy that is finding the antler. I am cutting the antler. I am packaging it and shipping it just like on old <laughs> Mrs. Doubtfire. I box it, then I ship it. <laughs> and uh, that's what I do. Uh, I, I'm able to keep my prices way down because there is no middleman. There is no big time antler buyer. Uh, so that's where I'm be able to, to make my prices the best they possibly can be, but it does not come without hard work. There's been a lot of, a lot of hard work and scaling it is not easy. And I'm, I still have not scaled it to the point where I want to. So dog chews, uh, that's one novelty items. There's all kinds of novelty items that, that come with the antler stuff, whether it's drop tines or, um, even just a little bit of tanned fur or the taxidermy, any of that stuff. Crafters are looking for certain things. I'm always uh, supplying a certain lady with, uh, she's looking for specific mule deer shape to a certain white tail shape, some feathers, some this, that, just very specific in what she's needing. Then there's a home decor piece of, of antler sales, and it's pretty small in the world for antlers, a little more in taxidermy. Uh, you've got some interesting folks out there who like to buy the skull-related stuff, the weird stuff, uh, The uh, as far as even the, the devil worshipers that want the the Jacob sheep and the weird, the weird stuff. I don't, I've, uh, I've communicated with some people that want to do some weird stuff that I just really don't want to be a part of. Um, then there is the Asian market. That is, uh, something I don't know anything about and I'm not going to do, do anything with it. I, I know it's medicinal, it's supplemental and, uh, that's about all I can say about that. Then there's the velvet market. You can go into your pet store and see the uh, velvet antler powder. That is uh, quite a bit better than, say, my antler powder product, which is another thing I do. I grind up just a little bit of the chalky stuff, and it's a food additive that sprinkles on your dog food. Uh, and if your dog struggles with eating or it needs some extra nutrition or joint supplement, protein, any of that, uh, some protein and calcium are mainly the things the dog's going to get out of it, uh, as well as wanting to eat his food. Uh, and I've got some really good reviews and stories from people, which is super cool to hear that just that extra product that I made is helping their dog have a little, live a little longer life and, uh, is looking happier and coat is shinier. Uh, and that's directly from my customer. So that makes me feel happy that I'm doing, doing something good for, for people. Uh, so that, that powder is not the velvet powder. It's just the regular powder, but velvet powder I know is loaded with stuff and it is really good on their joints. Uh, but it is expensive and it's a market I'm not really into cause you got to get just the velvet and you can't do a high quantity of it. And then there's the collectors. 
these antlers can go for hundred dollars or less to uh, twenty thousand, or it can be world record stuff. You're looking well into hundred thousand or more. Uh, big high dollar pieces. Those are the world record pieces, and the um, just some of those high quality pieces. They're going to be not very many are going to get very high, but we're we're talking. 200 inch mule deer, 210, 20 inch mule deer. Those are still only going to be 2000, uh, I don't know, say $4,000 depending on the look. They all have to have a look to them. Good look. Uh, so that you can tell that there's, I heard it just gave away a lot of information right there as to what I'd be buying stuff for and wanting to sell it for. Cause I got to make a buck. Um, so, but that's, that's the collector's piece to it. And then there's farm deer. People kind of like that farm deer stuff. People don't, um, I, I, as an antler buyer, I don't like it. It's, uh, really saturated the whitetail market and put antler everywhere, big antler everywhere. And, and one of the questions when you see a big deer is, is it wild or is it farm? And with mule deer popping up, mule deer farms popping up, which I think is the worst idea in the world, especially with chronic wasting disease, uh, being pretty prevalent. And those mule deer are still going to be transported. Transporting wildlife deer is probably one of our bigger concerns of chronic wasting disease, but mule deer, especially let's leave them alone. Let's not farm them. Uh, I have a hard time with that one and it's, it's happening. We got a ranch here in South Dakota, probably another one that I don't know about. So I don't know what, like we were talking earlier, I don't know what this is doing to shed, shed hunting, uh, having a market around something you can buy and sell. Uh, it's not the only thing in the natural world that you can buy and sell. Uh, so it's not new, but it is a, is a thing and I'm contributing to it. So, uh, please don't blame me. I'm, I know I'm right there with, with you as a shed hunter, um, as a, um, buyer of sheds and, uh, a sportsman. So it, it's a, difficult conversation to have that I don't know where I sit on, on that. Um, but it's a, it's a useful market. People, people use it. And I use these products for my dogs and their teeth get healthier and they, they have something to do and chew and it's good for them. So I don't want that to go away. So that I have broken this, this, uh, down into a few things. Like I just went through, what are these antlers used for? The next category I'm going to talk about is finding a buyer. Then I'm going to discuss grading, how we grade uh, or downgrade. And then um, some of the prices for elk, deer, and some of those, you know, just elk and deer. And then how to uh, keep your buyers honest and an antler buyer's profit. I may or may not make friends in this process of of, uh, sharing this. If other antler buyers hear it, they're not going to like it uh, because this is a cutthroat business. Other antler buyers talk crap about other antler buyers. I haven't, I have not had a whole lot of interaction with face to face interaction with other antler buyers. Um, I got one in the area. That's a great guy. I, and we buy and sell from each other all the time. There's no reason why it can't be like that, but I know my antler buyer sign that's outside my house on a busy road has been stolen three times or ripped down and that is bolted into a wall. Uh, so every time I, I, that happened, I went bigger and put cameras on it and I just missed them the one time. Uh, and I went real big this last time, put it closer to my property, put more cameras on it and haven't been bothered since. So, um, I think they got the hint that I don't care what you do to me. I'm going to keep putting something bigger out there. Uh, but why steal my sign? It's, I know it's my competitors. I absolutely know it's my competitors and I got it narrowed down to one or two people that of who it is, but I'm not going to confront them on it. I'm just going to leave it alone. Hunting is not easy. It never has been. It takes dedication, motivation, a lot of patience, and quality gear. If you manage a food plot, put up stands, or need just one more game camera, we can help at MidwayUSA.com. We opened our doors in 1977 and continue to put customers first by offering super fast, same day shipping. For just about everything for the outdoors, go to MidwayUSA.com. For almost 50 years, 
Midway USA has been America's go-to source for just about everything for shooting, hunting, and the outdoors. Go to MidwayUSA.com to see our latest deals and promotions and take advantage of our super-fast same-day shipping. If you need a cooler, a new fishing rod, another rifle, ammo, or a reloading press, you can find it all at MidwayUSA.com. Thanks for your business. So the category of finding a buyer, it's not difficult, uh, but you got to find someone you trust. That can be difficult sometimes. Just know uh, what you have for antler is not gold. (laughs) I know we call it brown gold. It's still antler. Your antlers from 1970 with fly specks all over them or cow manure uh, are not the same as fresh brown elk sheds that are picked up each season. And if it sat there for half a year and it's faded on one side, there's micro fractures on that antler. It's not worth what it was when it was uh, brown and still a little bloody. So um, there is a, it's important to know first off is what you have isn't gold. Uh, So you can find a buyer on social media pretty easily. Uh, Maybe tougher to find someone you trust. Uh, You can get reviews easily on, on different places on where and who to sell to Googling there's websites and just finding a, finding a antler buyer in your area. Advertisements. Those are put in papers. Antler buyers are sometimes old school guys. I do it all the time. I put advertisements out there. Sometimes they work. Sometimes they don't. Uh, I spent 400 some bucks on an ad for the Nebraska game and fish, big game brochure. I didn't get much for calls on that at all. Um, traveling buyers, those guys come through, they'll post their routes. Uh, not a bad route to go. Uh, I think those are uh, any of these, any, I'm not going to say one's better than the other. They're all pretty great. Uh, country buyers, these guys stay pretty local. Um, they, they may have some lower prices. Maybe not depends on who they're connected with or what they're doing. Uh, typically not their full-time job for them. It's a, usually a little hobby job. Um, and they're the newer buyers typically buying as much as possible. Uh, or they could be older guys that are backing out of this and they're tired of traveling. Cause that was something they had done a lot. Uh, these folks usually sell to bigger buyers. Many are buyers that, uh, those other buyers and, and have those other buyers have funded them. Um, uh, some can compete with the big buyers if they're doing it right. Uh, these are your best bet for building a quality relationship with a shed buyer and, uh, making a quick sale. Uh, someone you can sell to pretty quickly. You can go sell 10 pounds, 20 pounds. That's not a big deal. The big buyers may not buy those. They're not going to travel five miles out of the way to buy your 10 pounds, your season's worth or 20 pounds of antler. Most likely not going to do that. Big buyers. This is their full-time job. They travel. The prices are high, uh, or they can be, can, might not be. Uh, so sometimes they are, sometimes they, they aren't. Uh, they have lots of connections and know the market. These guys work with the big antler chew companies that supply the mass amount of retail companies. Uh, and they buy large quantities and they, they sell to, um, those big companies and they have their own companies that they, they sell dog chews to. And then there's antler company, antler chew company buyers. These ones are a little harder to find. This would be, I would say, kind of, I, I might fall into this slash a country buyer, um, where I am. And these are these are totally I labeled these. This is not necessarily a thing written down, uh, but an, I'm an antler company. I have a it's Black Hills Antlers LLC, and it's a I, I am able to pay those top dollars. Top dollar, um, I prefer large quantities, but not necessarily. Uh, some of those, those antler companies, they just want to buy a lot and they sell a lot. Um, but, um, for me, that's, 
it's going directly to my choose company. So that's, that's one of those categories. Uh, the fur, I like this category name fur buyers transformed. This is the fur mark because the fur market tanked. Uh, so now many of those are moving on to buying antlers or they, they always had, but they'd buy a little bit here and there. It really wasn't their big concern. Well, sorry guys, you should have maybe did well with the fur, but not anymore. The fur market is, is slowly dying and it's not looking good. Um, so that's, that's not too big of a switch for them, but their company names still say whatever fur company in them. So it may be a little confusing on whether they buy antler or not. And I've heard a lot of crooked ones in, in, uh, recent history here. Chandelier makers, these guys pay some of the highest prices, but are also very picky, very picky, Um, and they're not all over. You might find guys that want to make some and you can buy some for pretty top dollar, but you're not selling everything you have. Um, they're looking for something specific. That might be like a four point brown, nice mule deer shed. Well, all you guys, whitetail, sorry, no luck. They don't need it. They don't need any, uh, they're looking for mule deer stuff. Uh, mainly sheds with zero damage, which could be pretty tricky. Even if it's natural damage, they don't like it. The next kind of buyer would be other crafters, uh, not a place to sell your, your whole collection. This is knife makers, Etsy creators, other artists looking for something to put in a, in a little art piece. Uh, typically, uh, they won't take the whole, whole mess off your hands. The next buyer is the China and overseas buyers. These buyers are the ones that, that have some of these, the the big buyers are the ones that have the deals and i think it's i think it's mainly chalk that's getting shipped off and ground up but again not my area so i'll i'll admit i don't know a lot about that and then again uh collectors looking out for the the best so as a shed hunter you may have access to a couple of these above uh but you just got to kind of see what's around you so let's dive into grading all right, so the grading is done. This is uh, different by every single buyer, and it is the most important to get the most out of your antler. If you can understand grading, I think I think you're gonna be happy and go into a sale uh, a lot more informed and, and comfortable with what's going on, or uh, uncomfortable because you got to call a buyer out on on trying to cheat you, which. Hopefully it doesn't happen. A lot of great guys out there, so so you should be should be fine. But the the top one of the things I see in advertising shed prices all the time is the top dollar price for brown antler is deceiving. Uh, they'll say seventeen bucks a pound for deer, uh, and that might be 1% or 0% of your antler. They're looking for something that's large, but that initial price was 17 and it goes down to 15, 13, 12, 10 for just regular old, anything under 120 inch antler. So you, you have a $5 a pound and this is all sold by the pound typically, unless it's a specific piece, uh, that is, uh, so by the pound is what we're selling this at. So I didn't hope I didn't miss a step there and I hope you're staying with me. Um, so even if that top dollar is, is high, it doesn't mean anyone is cheating you, but it, it could, it's just their way of, it's a marketing camp away method. If you can throw out that big number right there, it attracts them and you're still going to be paying, paying a fair price. They're paying a fair price for everything else. If I advertise at that 12 bucks a pound, then that's, it's just being more honest with this is what you got here. Oh, you've got 170 inch deer here. Okay. That one we're going to set over here and we're going to talk about it later as a totally different, uh, side piece price. We're going to, we're going to sell it, buy it by the price. So, um, every, again, every antler buyer is going to do this a little differently. Uh, and, and you got to figure out how to get the best buck fear price by, by learning the stuff. So again, stay with me, take some notes if you need to. Bidding wars are not something you should, uh, are going to help you because that buyer is not going to really like that and may not engage. 
I'm done. I'm I've done it, but I'm gonna disengage with bidding wars on prices. I know that's capitalism, but man, go to the next buyer. I don't have time for that. I'm not raising my prices. I, these are my prices. It's what they are. And if you like it, great. If you don't, okay, go to the other guy. It's fine. Uh, I have my expenses that make that very difficult uh, to raise that price any higher, which I'll get to in a little bit as well. So um, also, if you negotiate a price that's higher, and I'll tell you, the big buyers, there ain't no negotiating. Um, and many of the guys that have been in the business for a while, there's no negotiating. Uh, they're uh, they're going to grade you way pickier. You may not actually get that good of a deal because you negotiate yourself up another 50 cents or a dollar a pound. Well, now they're going to look at yourself a little closer and downgrade a little bit more. So just know that it's probably not going to help you much. So typically there's three grades of antler that most antler buyers are going to go by. A, B, and C, or brown, hard white, and chalk. Some antler buyers are going to add in a plus or a minus, but that's not usual unless you have a lot or um, you are working closely with that buyer. Uh, but again, that's up to that buyer. Um, you can definitely see that in the C minus or what I often call just junk. So, um, an example of an A or a brown antler, if you follow my Instagram, you'll see my four-year-old, now five-year-old, explaining the difference between brown and, and hard white. He was grading for me the other day. Uh, after I bought some and sorting it, so he did a good job. But A brown or brown is the no cracks anywhere, not even hairlines uh, in any of the stuff on any either side. Uh, some buyers are going to take stuff that is a little faded, uh, but you get some of that white tail from Nebraska where the, all they have to rub on is a fence post. They have no color to it, so you're going to have those prairie deer where they're white but they're still a brown deer. If they're faded, they that may get downgraded to a B or a hard white, uh, but not necessarily. He, if it is faded enough, I can feel it in the density of the antler. I can tell if that's been degraded, if it's still polished and shiny. Yeah, throw in the brown pile, but if it's starting to get lose some weight to it, then there's things that have happened on the inside of that antler that you can't see until you get cutting into it or you give it to a dog and he real he finds out it doesn't last as long especially with mule deer uh there's a lot of mule deer that just i shot one a few years ago with my bow that uh it's just a not a polished antler it looks like it laid there for uh it almost looks like it was a deadhead if i hadn't told told somebody that i shot that and it died right there i would have thought that's a deadhead based on that antler just that slight deterioration that it has to it so that's your A uh, or brown antler. Your B antler is to your hard white is either that faded or it has one side which is good, everything solid, should have a little color to it. The other side is faded with some cracks, not deep, deep cracks to it, but just some uh, hairline cracks. The reason why these prices also go down on each one of these grades is because with a greater brown, you can do a lot of things with it. And as you have damage or you go down in grade, you have uh, weathering, uh, chew marks, there's less and less you can do with it. Um, different products are can be made out of some of those, but for the most part, there's a lot less you can do. Therefore, it's worth less. So that, that B grade, different on both sides. The C grade... Uh, quality C grade is cracks on both sides, um, faded. Uh, I'll even take some deep cracks on one side or, or, uh, some deep cracks on both, but I can feel that antler, hold it. And as long as it's not flaky, I can't bang it and it's going to break. Uh, it's got, it's got a good majority of its integrity. I'll buy it. Uh, but if it, you can, there's going to be some waste too. That's why that stuff is pretty cheap. You don't get a lot out of it is because there's waste when you cut a, cut the tips that those tips are are pretty weathered and not very strong to hold up to like a dog's chew, chewing. 
Uh, and then there's junk or C minus, or you might call it damaged. Uh, that stuff is chalky. It's falling apart. I'll buy a little here and there to grind up, but right now our market's not doing all that hot. So I'm going to, I'm going to put that in the, the damage, not going to buy it pile. And sometimes people have like two antlers and they just throw it in there and it's just piling up for me because I'm not using it. And if you're listening to this right now, uh, I should have said this probably in the beginning. It was May 4th, 2023. Uh, but I'm hoping to make this podcast relevant for the next five years or five years ago. It doesn't matter. There's there's room for uh, um, except some of these prices that I'll get to here. Unless there's some big changes coming, which hopefully not. I, I want another 10, 15 years of doing this uh, before I have legislation that's going to mess with it. So uh, there, you got your A, B, and C. If they throw in something, a different grade, then uh, you, it would just be slightly downgraded. So the other grades in there are special pieces, and you might call that craft grade or select brown, where uh, it's a uh, it's high high quality good stuff. Um, again, more grading. If you have more grades, you're going to have tighter grading, which then you're going to have higher prices. So. Take that into account uh, when you're learning about your buyer and what they, how they do that. How a antler gets from A to B to C uh, can also happen from various downgrading. So if you have cracking uh, and, or the color is off, those I think are kind of the number one. We're, that's what we're going to look at for sure. Uh, cracks and color. Uh, if it's ugly and deformed... If it's a drop time thing that's three inches long, it's almost worthless. Um, just the one side. I, I've had that. Just weird little things that it's a lot of weight, but worthless. Deformed. Might be pretty cool. Some of those pieces are just better as a as a uh, uh, novelty piece to hang up. The big bulbous horns from a drop tine where that blood pools up, not always the best. That stuff is... When you cut into it, is can be stinky. It uh, uh, can be red. It's uh, unappealing uh, to to some, a dog owner trying to give that to their dog. Um, also, farm elk or deer is unpredictable. It's got weird densities. If they're cut off before it's fully hard horned, uh, they're weak. They have blood in them. They can stink. Uh, it's it's risky, so we're not going to pay near as much what we're going to pay on that. And that can be B prices. It could be C prices. It kind of depends on what, what the, the farmer does with that. Uh, stains, water stains, uh, I, all that is n- just doesn't help it. Brings that appeal down. Also, it sat in water. It soaked some of that up, causing issues. Uh, mule deer also can get a few inches of some oil. Uh, kind of sucked into the bases of their antler. It's from some sort of juniper uh, where that sucks in and that can be toxic to pets. So we can't be giving that to dogs. So there's a lot of waste there in that. And it shows up differently from a brown antler to a chalk antler, but you can see it all the way through. Uh, Fly specks on anything lower than brown antler are on there for good. Uh, a grade antler, brown antler, you can, you can get some of that cleaned off, but I really don't take like taking a truckload of antler and taking it to my utility sink and scrubbing antler with hot water and soaking it and rubbing and it's not fun. So that's going to get a little downgraded when it's, and that might be a buck, all right, instead of a $12 a pound antler, then it's 11 because I got to spend some time cleaning all that junk. And again, time is some money. Again, ugly and nope, I read that. Uh, water damage, pink. If uh, you get pink antler, that is oftentimes from maybe more drier cli- climates where it sits out. You see it a lot more in some elk for some reason, but uh, that stuff sits out and it turns pink. Uh, that is just a good indicator of some more weathering, so it's, it's less desirable. Uh, I did, and I know how wrong this is right now, I did have somebody tell me, um, that initial buyer, uh, that you can spray that with a mixture of bleach water, uh, and you can, and then set it in the sun to let it dry and that pink will go away. But these are meant for dog shoes. So 
you, you I'm assuming you wash that off of there. If you wash that off, then you're probably pretty good, but you're putting bleach on something and you are no longer what my website says is all natural dog chew. Uh, it's been changed. So, uh, I don't do that. Uh, I make sure that there's no products put onto my dog shoes. Uh, lack of color gets some downgrade. Um, squirrel or porcupine shoes on the tips are not as a big a deal unless it's a big quality trophy piece. Uh, but on the base, that's a problem where all that weight is. I don't like those things all chewed up. Uh, manure or mud. Some of that can be really bad. Some of it can be no big deal. But again, I'd rather clean fly specks off than whole chunks of manure. That's the worst. Uh, skull plates or skulls that are on attached. I have to, that doesn't downgrade the antler, but it does make me have to estimate the weight because that skull or the skull plate is worthless. It's going in the garbage unless it's a, a full, full skull that I can clean off and I'll give you an extra five bucks for that. And I'm going to go sell that thing for 10. Um, so it's, I'm not getting a lot from it, but just have someone doing some little projects with it. Uh, velvet or very light antler, uh, that stuff goes straight to chalk. If it died early and it was all chalky or like really spongy antler, it's worthless. Uh, the velvet antler is chalk stuff and it's pretty much worthless to me. And some items, I, I keep finding more and more items with some random thing that go in the, what we call the problem pile. For instance, uh, antler that rides in the back of the, the feed truck that has got the grease gun back there, or that gets thrown in a mineral lick tub that's got the grease gun in there or some other thing and, or manure in there. And then it fills up with water and marinates manure. Yeah. I got a stack of that antler that's just sitting around. It's it was worthless. Um, it's brown. The antler is brown in a bad way. It's graded as chalk antler, but it's still brown. Uh, so not good stuff. So let's talk antler prices and what things are worth. Uh, we're talking April or May 2023 prices. Uh, there's some variability this year and some things changing. Uh, don't really know what's going to happen here in deer market might fall through fall break or yeah, break. We'll say that, uh, have some issues. Uh, don't really know. Uh, I am just buying my antler and doing what I do with it. So I don't worry about it too terribly much, but, um, there's a reason why antlers do not post their pictures and guys that are wanting to sell, give, Antler buyers, all kinds of crap. Why don't you post your picture prices? Just post them. Well, some do, and uh, they're getting some antler stolen from from them. The guys will post their their prices, and someone will say, "Come in and beat them by a quarter, or beat them by fifty cents a pound." Uh, all they got to do is see the guy, message him, say, "No, I'll pay more than that." Uh, I've done it before. Uh, don't really do it anymore because I'd rather have quality relationships with the other buyers that I work with. So, uh, I don't want to do that. Uh, I'm just, that's a bidding war. I'm done. Uh, so the, uh, that is why we are not posting our, our prices. They can get stolen there and it also, uh, creates competition and I've gotten harassed about, well, that's capitalism. Uh, but I would just rather me set my prices. It's what they are got enough work involved with this that if you don't want to sell for that, I'm giving you a fair price, then uh, I'm sorry, again, go somewhere else. So elk, elk prices for brown, uh, hard white and chalk. A brown antler for elk is somewhere in that 16 to 19 bucks a pound. Uh, if you head west to Wyoming, Montana, uh, they'll seem to be the heart of the high, high dollar, Western Wyoming. Uh, high dollar antler and I hear some frequent 20 plus dollars a pound over there as you get away from from that area and all the way east prices drop uh, they'd be happy to get probably 12 13 14 bucks a pound because anyone that all that antlers got to get back back west or some of it gets back west to a lot of the buyers uh, hard white elk uh, nine ish to 11. Chalk is chalk elk is somewhere two and a half to to six bucks a pound. 
Uh, that's pretty high in that $6 area. Uh, deer, brown deer, $10 to 15 bucks a pound. Uh, that's had some big swings and get getting 15 bucks a pound anymore. 14 bucks a pound, whew, even 13s. You're doing pretty darn good. That's not what's happening right now, but hard white five to 10 bucks a pound. Uh, chalk is 50 cents to three bucks a pound, three bucks. Good luck. Um, sometimes I pay that when I need some, uh, and even for hard white deer, 10 bucks a pound, who man, sell it. If you can find that, sell it. That's doing really good. I won't buy it for that. I have before, but I can't right now. And the reason why I can right now, or I can't right now, uh, this happens with all buyers. We have all kinds of different supply and demand for this certain products that we are, we are currently looking for. Uh, there's times I need to fill an order for a chandelier guy. There's times I need to fill a, an order for another shoe company or whatever for this grade. Uh, I might have a thousand pounds of this one grade, so I don't want to go out and buy more and have it just sit there. It's just money sitting there. So that's, that's wasting, uh, my buying money and, and making that difficult to go out and buy more. So if there is antler that I, the highest priced antler is stuff that I can flip and sell within the shortest amount of time. That's, that would be the highest priced antler. So maybe even, I just made this up right now, but, uh, maybe if you knew exactly what that antler buyer needed, he's probably going to pay the best on that, that product. So the next thing you need to do is keep these, these buyers honest. So how you do that is to one, watch the scale and what they write down, stay right there, but don't micromanage them. They're, they're the professional doing this. Uh, so you need to just hold them accountable by being there. Don't leave and go run something. They might throw an antler on the scale after it's maxed out. I've heard it happen. I know the buyers that do that. They throw stuff on there after the scale maxed out. Um, have them teach you how to grade. I think that's the best way from that. I build relationships with people and like, Hey, this is what I'm doing right here. Um, also do the math with them. If you, write, write it down or, uh, especially on a big buy, if it's 20, 30 pounds, the antler buyer may not have time for that. But, uh, if you got four five, six thousand 6,000 pounds, do the math right there with them. Uh, I have done the math and realized I made a mistake. Called the guy right back up and say, I owe you 60 bucks. Can it, can you come back over here? And, uh, I messed up. So, uh, that is a good way to, to, to keep pay attention to that. And you can track that as well by getting a receipt. See if that price, I have people do this all the time. They ask what my prices are and then make a big deal about it in the conversation. But when I'm actually buying from them, they don't look at the prices. They don't, don't do the math on any of that. They don't see it. They're just trusting me. So it would be super easy to drop my price and do a little math change and whatever else. But, um, if you get a receipt, it's right there and they can get it down to the penny. Uh, be clear on the price per pound that you're getting. Uh, so discuss with the, with the buyer, uh, what are your prices for all the grades? Okay, great. Yes or no. Want to meet up? Yes or no. And then, uh, if, if a buyer throws a price at you instead of weighing it, it's not necessarily dishonest, but it is an option for smaller buys. And I've done that for when I show up and there's a box and it's like, I just don't have the time to weigh this out or it's cold out. And, um, I tell them I'll give you 50 bucks for that box. They're, they're happy. I'm happy. Great. Off we go. Uh, we're typically pretty good at estimating weight, so it's not a bad route to go. Um, but if you got a whole pile there or you got anything over 50 pounds, you should be weighing that for sure. Um, and then, uh, also be an honest seller. Don't hide stuff. If it is varnished, if it is stained, if it was colored with coffee, if it was, uh, changed in any way, if it had screws in the bottom of that, that upsets me more than anything. When I hit a screw with my bandsaw, I just lost a 35 to $40 bandsaw blade because there was a stupid screw in the bottom and that's un unnecessary weight that i'm paying for stolen antler antlers uh that's a big problem uh and then there's legal aspects that you need to be honest about know your regulations on where and what you can sell so the profit 
in this. First thing a lot of sell sellers uh, should realize is that antler prices have a market nationally and as a buyer for myself, like I was telling you earlier, there's certain things I need. My demand rises and falls based on what I have and who I supply. Uh, how much we buy and how much we sell for, these are trade secrets. And they're, they aren't going to be made public. They're not going to be even buyer to buyer being told what what's what. I do a little bit with one guy, uh, but that's about it. Um, but I can tell you that... To make a buck a pound can be a good deal and a, and a goal for a lot of buyers um, if, you, if they have enough poundage to do that. Uh, but sometimes it's not enough. If you're traveling, that's, that's, some people get annoyed when I ask, where, they ask, what are your antler prices? And I ask, well, where are you? Uh, if you're in New Mexico, you're not going to get the same prices if I have somebody show up my house and want to sell me some antlers. I can't give that same price because there's a lot of fuel costs involved in driving to New Mexico. Uh, that's why having antlers all around the antler buyers around the country are really good. Sometimes when fuel prices are high, it's 30 to 50 cents per mile. Uh, and I can cut off 50 cents a pound uh, on a, on a load. So, uh, there's other costs also to owning a business. So a dollar a pound isn't always enough. Sometimes we're going to make a buck a pound. Sometimes it, on some of those products, maybe there's things that you can make 10 bucks a pound. Maybe there's, there's times, but not always. And what if it is, we we'll worked for it. Uh, so costs for the buyers to uh, know that why we got to make a little money on this. Fuel costs, vehicle trailer costs. I have a, I have a 16 foot enclosed trailer that I use for, for moving mounts. Uh, that costs me money to insure it. Do not insure it. That's my, with my vehicle, but to, uh, put plates and register it, uh, on top of that insurance, vehicle insurance, the, um, upkeep on a vehicle. And you're putting all those miles on the damages that you have along the way on the road, the, uh, uh, business insurance next are taxes my gosh if you're in a state with with uh income tax well there's four percent right there uh for colorado uh but income tax some states have some states don't uh but i pay a sales tax and i pay my federal tax every year uh so this is something that and i get put up kind of high in one of those brackets like that, up to 25 percent or something like that uh paying taxes is not very fun for me so, uh, or any business owner. So that's something that gets factored in. Try and figure out how you can still run a business and not just do this for free. Uh, shipping. Uh, I got to pay, pay shipping to ship my antler, my dog chew to the customer. Free shipping is a great, uh, tool to, to make sure that, uh, um, my customer gets the best price possible. Uh, and it's, it's clear. Uh, office supplies. My gosh, this is huge. I'm sitting on a brand new computer right now because my other one died because my wife spilled, wa spilled water all over it. Um, new computer. I've got two printers here, toner for that, the paper, the labels, the shipping materials, heating my office all the time uh, or cooling it, uh, business cards, design expenses, uh, scales, storage, shop supplies, saws, sanders, vacuum systems. Uh, that's a lot of money right there. Uh, then we go to sell all these things. You're like, oh, we'll get 40 bucks for this little hunk of antler. Well, there's seller fees on Etsy, eBay, Amazon, retail. You ever watch Shark Tank? Retail isn't always the best option. Retail prices are about 40 to 50% more than what the buyer gets. Uh, ever there, if I were to sell a, these are just rough numbers. If I were to sit the uh, pets co. Uh, I don't, I don't do any of the stuff in there, but if they sold a chew for $10, they would most likely buy it from the seller, uh, for $5. So there's, they have to make their profit. Um, so that's a, it's not always the, the biggest profit margin there to still get customers to come in and buy. And then there's other operational costs that I have memberships cost me five bucks a month to have a business banking account. I use this app called Pixel Cut that 
It's like 60 bucks a pound to help edit pictures and do things on my podcast. The podcast is, is wrapped up into this business. So any of these expenses and things I have with that, uh, all of that gets wrapped up into there. Um, the cost of having a website and a domain, those are additional costs. So a buck a pound sometimes is really, again, not doable. And I really hope down the line, all reading those, I hope I'm making money. <laughs> Uh, I really hope I'm making money in this process, but uh, there's a lot to it, and that's the whole point of this. So with all this information, you should be able to feel good about selling your antlers or not. I do not talk people out of their antlers. I give my buddies crap sometimes that hold on to them uh, for whatever reason that you're sitting on them, but if you want to keep it, keep it. I got my own pilot I keep right here. It's fine. Don't sell it. Uh, Hold on to it. And if it's your, it's got meaning to you, absolutely keep it. Do not sell it. So I just want you to feel good about it. This is a business. It's uh, not buying from a buddy where nobody's profiting. Uh, this is this is a business. So um, it's a uh, it's something I love to do. I love meeting people. Uh, you all know Drea. She was on the podcast. I bought from her. That's where I got to know her. Uh, there is, has been plenty of other people that I've gotten to know. I've gone shed hunting with them. I've gone hunting with them. Uh, I've, I've gotten to know them just through the antler buying. So it's a fun, fun deal. So if you are interested in selling, let me know, uh, I buy year round, uh, and will better be able to assist you, uh, in the next few months. I gotta, I gotta wait just a little bit. I got some big buys coming up I'm getting a little cash poor, but, uh, it, it's going to pick back up here pretty pretty quick. There's a lot of buying happening right now. Uh, and I'm trying, it's a busy season. I'm trying not to, to get overstocked on too much that I can't get rid of. And I just sit on for too long and can't ever buy any again. So, uh, but again, thanks again for, for listening, uh, reach out with your location and and you want to hear what the current prices are. uh, And I'm happy to tell you, or I'll just tell you, I'm sorry, I don't make it down there. If I told you a price, it's inaccurate. So don't, you can't really use that price to compare it to another buyer because I can't make it down there. I can't buy it. That's not the accurate price for your market in your area. Again, thanks for listening. If you are new to this podcast, go give me a follow and a like on uh, Western Hunting Podcast. Watch Waypoint TV's Buck Fever presented by Primos. Saturdays from 8 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Yes! Drake Man! Fire Man! He's big. Trust the process and feel the rush on Waypoint TV.